Hi everyone, my name is Wan Sing and I'm from Hatch. We are an impact-driven organization that wants to bring goal careers to everyone. What you're looking at is an online webinar, Web Design 101, that we held on 18 May as part of our Digital Pathways for All series. Um, our guest speaker, Janelle Lee, co-founder and chief product officer at Bantu, um, shared about her insights and experiences on what are the elements that build a good website. She is a Singaporean passionate about technology and social good. Um, in this workshop, the participants learn some of the good practices on what it takes to build a good website and how they can go about building their own. We hope you enjoy the webinar. And feel free to leave your comments below if you have any questions. Yep. So web design is essentially the process of creating websites by planning, conceptualizing, and arranging content intended. So this could be from the structure and the layout to the images, the colors, the fonts, and the graphics. So it's like what creates the overall look and feel when you're using a website. So why is web design important? Um, web design is important because first impressions matter. And an outdated, confusing, or broken website will hurt your brand and will fail to create a compelling message online for your potential customers. So a website with a good web design clearly answers who I am. Uh, next slide, please. Clearly answers who I am, what I do, and what can the visitor do here. It also resonates with the audience, um, has, a, has a value proposition, calls visitors to action, is optimized for multiple devices, and most importantly, is always changing to adapt to new design trends. So web design encompasses different aspects like design, coding, user experience, and many more. But for today, we, we will be focusing on one element of web design, which is uh, user interface elements, UI elements for short. And these are the elements you may find on any websites or apps you're using. It could be the checkbox or the search field or even the progress bars. And these are one of the few many things that are being planned and thought carefully before building a website. So our speaker Janelle will share more on this later. And with this, I think it's a good time to invite our speaker Janelle, co-founder and product lead of Bantu, to share about potential careers as well as her own career and experience in the digital and design industry. So Janelle is passionate uh, for technology and social good. Combining her strengths in human behavior and customer-centric product design, she has worked in Singapore and New York. Uh, she left Amazon and is now co-founding the social enterprise Bantu. Today, she has worked with hundreds of impact-driven organizations to adopt technology. So without further ado, I'll pass my time on to Janelle. Are you there, Janelle? Hi everyone, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, okay, um, let me try to share my screen first. Uh, thanks for that really wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, I'm glad that I'm able to you know, share my experience today uh, with every, everyone who is here. Um, I think it has been um, uh, quite a journey for me because um, I started off um, really learning on my own when you know there weren't really resources uh, and classes available like Hatch you know like they actually think of this as uh, something that they want to develop students and learners to be able to pick up um, but for myself you know it really started from learning on my own um, just pure interest and you know turning that into an actual career um, so I'll be sharing, you know, how I managed to do that and also um, my experiences and some things that I learned along the way. Um, so just, just a quick note, like if you have any questions um, during the session itself, just feel free to write it in the chat box first um, and I will go through it at the end of the session. Uh, that can be, you can write anything or you can ask a question uh, during the end as well. Um, so just to introduce myself again, uh, I'm Janelle. So uh, I've been a social entrepreneur for the last uh, two and a half years. Um, co-founding my social enterprise in Singapore called Bantu, um, which I'll share a bit more a bit later. So uh, I'm currently the product lead as well as um, I do marketing as well for the for the social enterprise. So um, let's start the presentation. So I'll be sharing about how to design for a delightful experience. Um, you know, it's not just about um, just about how it looks. Uh, that's also very important. But also, uh, how do you make sure that it's really what the user wants as well as aligning that to business goals that depending on the organization or company that you work for. So um, so to share a bit about Bantu, um, so Bantu means to help in Malay and Indonesian and what we really want to do is be able to provide technology to those who are underserved um, and in the business world actually there's a huge uh, amount of non-profits that are actually not tech savvy, you know, they still rely on really just trying to deliver good and trying to create impact in their own way. Um, but unfortunately, they don't really use much technology tools like the way that startups and, you know, big organizations do. So uh, we really saw that gap uh, when 
uh, me and my other co-founders, um, we were in New York uh, for this program, which I'll share a bit later. Um, and we realized that, you know, non-profits have such huge potentials to deliver good. Um, but as a result of uh, other priorities, uh, productivity is something that's not really um, something that they really focus on and try to improve, uh, tr especially through the use of technology. So I really want a product that... Um, is uh, users who are really, uh, they might not be familiar with technology. They usually are of an older, slightly older age group in their career. Um, and we are designing something like this for them. So um, just to share, uh, these, you know, these are currently you know, the, the, the non-profits and social enterprises that we're working with. Um, they use the product that we built. And um, it's been such an inspiring journey to be able to help this group of organizations that no one really, really thinks about when it comes to technology. It's uh, usually about recruiting volunteers and getting more donations. But for us, we try to enable them to have more capacity um, and build, um, build their productive capacity to help them to do more. Um, that's what we've been doing for the last um, two and a half years. Um, so in last, uh, last, year, in, uh, last year in December, uh, we were awarded the President's Challenge Social Enterprise Startup of the Year. Um, for the reason um, that, you know, we are like an ecosystem builder within the social space right now. And uh, we really want to champion that use, the use of good technology, easy to use technology within um, the social space. Um, as a result of that, um, I think we are very honored to be able to receive an award from the president for recognizing us for like the best young social enterprise in Singapore last year. Um, and, you know, that's really all the credit to my team as well. Um, just so I would like to share a bit about my web design journey. Um, so it's actually quite, uh, it's a quite a twisted kind of like, um, I didn't know I wanted to do this at the very beginning kind of story. So, um, so these are, I guess, pinnacle points of my current career, which is, you know, not like super long, like 10 years or something, but it's the different parts of where I decided to know that that's how I know that, you know, doing design and product design, web design is something that I'm really passionate about and, um, this is my current career. So um, I started off with, uh, I graduated from NUS. Um, I studied communications and new media uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, I joined that, I, I studied that because I've always been interested in design, media, and you know how communication is such a powerful tool. Um, and I also minored in psychology. So um, I guess it was, I didn't know it back then, but you know, I was already interested in like, psychology, design, and I just didn't know what that really means as a career because I think back then, things that were very popular is like business, um, what else was popular? I mean, medicine and all those is um, like the standard kind of engineering and I never even know that like, you know, um, web design is something that could be made into a career. Um, so what happened was that I went on the NUS Overseas Colleges Program. Um, that, that is a program within NUS that encourages entrepreneurship and um, as a result of that, I managed to do an internship in New York um, at a company called Trex. So um, Trex is a social media analytics company. Um, when I was there, I, I was a product intern. So what that meant was uh, I would see different problems that my user has, that people who are businesses who are using the social media analytics tool. And then I would solve, I would understand like why, you know, there's that problem of why they wanted to do something but they couldn't or there's something there but they didn't know how to use it and I would find all these problems and then try to craft a solution for it after understanding the user. So I never got to do the design part, like, you know, the actual designing part during my internship there, but I worked really closely with this UX designer who's from Israel and um, he has like more than 10 years of UX experience when UX is not even a very popular field back then. Um, so I knew that, you know, this guy must be something special. So I spent a lot of time with this, uh, with this mentor of mine. And then he showed me that, you know, there's this field called UX design, web design, and all the different kinds of like software design, basically. And um, that's when I really realized like, wow, you know, there's such a thing. And that was like maybe four years ago. And in the US, you know, um, web design was a really huge thing. App design was huge as well. So in, and back then, you know, there wasn't really a trend here yet, like now, like everyone knows what it is now, like. Last time when I say UI UX, people don't even know what's that in Singapore. Um, so we know things have really changed over the years. Um, because and and after I left, um, after I finished my internship there, I came back, I graduated, and then I joined Amazon. Um, I was doing marketing there, uh, like marketing analytics, um, some site merchandising as well. 
And you know, when I was working there, I think you know it was a it was a really good environment to learn. Uh, you know how co- big corporations work, how they scale. You know how they how do they ensure that their operations can run over so many different countries all over the world. And I was very lucky to be able to um do um like to work on the Prime Now project, uh, launching that in Singapore together with the rest of the team that I was hired with. Um, and that was a real eye-opening experience because I realized that, you know, there's so much that you can do with your career. Like, you can change so many things with the time that you have in your career. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that my time I use in the next 30 years of my career is going to be something fruitful and something that um, would have changed and have meaning to others. So, as a result of that, um, I decided to leave Amazon because I think doing something more meaningful and um, that really, you know, goes on the ground and impacts, like, the parts of society that I care about uh, is very important to me. So as a result of that, I decided to leave my job and join Bantu together with my other co-founders. Um, so that's kind of the brief story. Um, so uh, this is, these are some uh, pictures of me uh, when I was interning and just not knowing anything back then uh, with my really uh, good-looking German manager. Um, he, he really inspired me to go on this path. Um, he was a musician, actually, just to tell you guys. Uh, he graduated from a degree in uh, music from some US college, uh, but he decided to go on the product management path doing software as well. Um, and you know, this, this was kind of the view that I had every day while walking to work. Uh, this is like the Empire State Building uh, lighted really nicely every day. And you know, it was, I think that really the experience that transformed the way I think about uh, life. It sounds so cliche, um, but it's true because it really shows you that the world is so much bigger than we really think it is. Um, because, you know, Singapore is a very small country. So most of the time, like, we, we can't really understand the, 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 the vastness of the world. But um, when you go to a country as complicated and big as uh, America, you realize that, wow, you know, everybody just does what they want. And there's not much regulation or anything. Everyone just pursues their dreams. And, you know, that's something that I will always remember. Um, and then when I moved to Amazon, like, I worked with a really wonderful team um, that really taught me, you know, that... Um, um, I should just be brave and do what I want. Um, because when I saw my colleagues and, you know, people who have been in the, just in the e-commerce industry for really long, they really encouraged me to, like, do it now. Like, just start, just start your entrepreneurship journey now because you'll never have a good time to do it anyway because, you know, they had, and all of them were ladies, as you can tell. So, like, they had, like, family commitments going on. So, they, they really, I guess, gave me that push to, you know, just take the lead and just do whatever that I had the opportunity to. Um, so, um, but actually the backstory of how I really started, uh, most people don't know this, but I actually started off as a designer since I was really young. So, um, I had really, um, it's just a passion kind of thing. Like I like to design logos and po- posters and t-shirts and random things like this, um, just for fun. Like it wasn't to make money or, you know, it wasn't anything like this. It was just like for fun. So I just did a lot of graphic design uh, for fun using like PowerPoint and like Photoshop and it was just really simple kind of things. And I just didn't know that, you know, the experience could actually become like what I'm doing today as a career. So that's just uh, something for the younger people who are like not sure what they want to do. Like don't underestimate like any of the, any of the things that you are doing right now in, whether it's a school project, you're doing things for fun, for free, you know, it's totally fine because you don't know what that will eventually result in. Um, so, Right now, um, you know, with all my accumulated experiences and knocking here and there, not knowing what I was going to do for my career, um, I am now building this software together with my wonderful team um, that helps nonprofits to manage, like, manage their members, manage their volunteers, manage their contacts, um, helping them to send uh, communication to them via SMS, emails, um, you know, automating a lot, of the re- a lot of the manual tasks that they usually do within a nonprofit, and then, you know, doing that reporting for them and, um, this is something that is really lacking within uh, the industry in Southeast Asia and in Singapore as well. You'd be quite surprised. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of journey that I'm embarking on right now. And for the past two years, uh, two years of building the product, um, I've gone through so much from like not knowing how to, not knowing how to create shadows, uh, not knowing how to do any, like draw any form fields, like any kind of UI design. I didn't know anything at all, but I started from ground zero from the very beginning and um, it's been a long uh, way, you know, it's been a long, journey um and um really doing it is the best way to learn that's the that's my advice just do it and um have people to 
who can see your potential and trust in your potential, basically. Because I was like nothing last time. It's just, um, just someone who has a lot of passion. But then now it's translating into results, which is something that, you know, I'm very proud of till today. Um, so just to show you a bit of the UI that, you know, um, by the way, uh, UI means user interface. Um, so some of the UI elements that we've created over time, um, you know, for example, uh, this is like a form builder. We call it the form builder. So it's where people select different form fields to be able to create a sign up form. So whatever this, whatever they select is a drag and drop. You know, you have different categories of information, not just like clicking one by one. So it's a really, even small things like this is, uh, we really think of it like, really like well thought out for users who don't know how to use technology like you know we just keep it really really um, simple for people to use and intuitive as possible so in this example if I want to select all the different contact information I just need to select all in this that are available here and it just goes here and you can just easily drag and drop um, to order the form instead of like you know clicking uh, like push up push up push up all the time so um, there's different elements within this, like uh, the UI elements, there's the UX as well, which is, you know, how the user can achieve their goal easily. So um, even a small thing like this, um, it actually takes a lot of effort and thinking behind it, planning and designing and in the, in the end, implementing it. So another example um, is this thing that we have a date picker. So, uh, you know, it's such a small thing, but a lot of thought actually goes into it. So um, if you look at this pop-up right now, it's basically to help users to select um, different to create dates in a very very fast manner like different dates you know you have volunteering projects that happen every week like three times a week like, so how are you going to do that so we have problems and then we create like solutions to help um, and most of these things you know they are very underlooked but actually uh, we spend a lot of time trying to find the best solution for it um, other examples would be like helping the user to send an sms so we develop a very simple way of just selecting people that you want to send a message to and just sending it so it's like it's really quick uh, and um, this is one of the things that people use a lot. Um, the other thing is the time slot reminders. So um, this is one of the designs that we developed to help users to create like um, SMS and messages that can quickly uh, put in their form, their, their field. So it'll be like, reminder, hi Janelle, we're happy to have you as a volunteer befriender for project XYZ. So it's, um, we, we need to create very, very simple things like this to help a user achieve the eventual goal that they want. So these are actually real examples. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, has uh, really, it's a very important part of the product that we have is actually the attendance app. So, you know, this is about web design. This class is thinking about web design, but actually this is built on a, it's a, it's a web app. So it's actually a mobile optimized version of a attendance app that anyone can just go to a link and quickly mark people's attendance. So we actually have a few versions of this and the, the first one we developed, um, you know, look really bad and uh, there were a lot of like design flaws in it, but you know, this is the current version that we have after iterating it for uh, quite a while, like twice. Yeah, so um, it has come into this very polished version that, you know, we don't need to worry about anymore that the users don't know how to use it. It's very simple to use. Just click on the yellow button and it's done. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the goal of it. Um, so now, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing, um, you know, the experiences I've had, uh, just knocking my head around. So I, I wanted to be able to share, um, you know, the proper way of um, learning web design. Um, learning from scratch, um, you know, is not easy. There's a lot of resources out there, but I think I, put, I tried to put together um, something that I think is very relevant for the real, real web design. Like when you actually do it in a startup or in a company, this is, you know, the things that you need to know. Um, so the first thing is I wanted to share a bit about what web design is. I think uh, just now, I think um, uh, one of the participants actually shared a very good uh, understanding of it. Um, essentially, um, what web design is consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is visual design and the second part is interaction design. So visual design is basically how the website looks, uh, how the web design looks. And this includes like things like illustrations, graphics, icons, fonts, uh, layouts, how, how everything is put together to look like a nice polished piece of art. That is the visual part of it. The second part of it is called interaction design, which refers to how people interact with that product. So, you know, how do the, how do the buttons, uh, what are the different states of the buttons? What happens if I hover on something? What happens if I accidentally click something wrongly and I want to undo? What happens uh, when the page is loading? Yeah, so these are like the interaction that the screen has with the user. And as a result of visual design plus interaction design, you have this 
these are the two important elements uh, in web design that you need to know if this is a career that you want to embark on. So um, these are specific skills that you do require in web design. So the art, the art of web design is pretty broad, um, in my opinion, of like reading and you know, understanding this field as much as I can. Um, it's really, really broad. And if you work in a really large company, um, it is very likely that you, know, you just need to master like one of the elements that I show here, like one of the skills that I show here. You just need to master one. But if you want to work for a startup that is fast growing or you know, a smaller team, like an agency or um, like a startup, um, you need to know a bit of everything and be good at at least one of them. So you need to know all of it uh, to a certain extent and then uh, be able to contribute to that company with that particular skill set or that interest that you have. So some of these, um, yeah, I've, I've highlighted six here as the most important ones, um, which is pretty exhaustive, I think. Um, the first one is visual design. So it's uh, focusing on the visual presentation. So someone who's really good at graphic design has a kind of like a graphic design kind of background is really good. Um, layout design. So layout is learning how to lay out things within a page um, to achieve objectives. So like, you know, ordering uh, which ones, which elements within the page are most important, which, uh, which are the which are the different buttons in the page that uh, is most important to a user. Um, learning how to do that visual hierarchy kind of arrangement is a very, very key skill. Um, color principles. Um, so colors are actually, colors is actually the foundation um, to web design because it is in every element that you create. Um, and not knowing how to use colors as a tool to help you in your, in your design uh, will end up very disastrous no matter whether you have good layout, good everything, but uh, when colors are a mess, um, it just looks like a very poorly developed product. So the fourth skill is that you need to know how to use design tools. So that means like uh, mock-ups and creating mock-ups and doing prototyping. Uh, and most of the time, the reason for this, you know, you need it to be able to show the end user um, how it will look like if you have an end user you can talk to. Or is to design tools are used to show like within the within your own team, like you know what are uh, how you e how you eventually envision the product or that feature to look like. So it's a it's a communication tool as well as at the very end, once you know you have done with you're done with your mock up and prototype, you need to pass that design over to the development team so that they can actually create it in real life and become the real thing. So you know it's a long process before something is actually developed. The fifth thing is coding language. So um, in web design, the focus is design. The focus is design, the design part. But it's very important to be able to know the coding languages that are being used uh, for the product that you're working on. And so some of the examples would be HTML and CSS. The reason for this is because uh, for something to be developed into like a real product, you do need a developer to help you to build it, like a coder, programmer to make it into real life. And to do that, you know, you need to array when you're using the design tool, um, it does create like code for the developer to be able to use that when he's actually creating the site. So you need to be able to arrange your elements, uh, draw the text boxes correctly, use the correct margins. So margins are like kind of like guidelines so that you don't spill the page, like you don't get up, like your design doesn't go over the page. So you need to know um, the language of talking to a developer because that helps you greatly with your communication persuading them, you know, why this is something that's necessary. So coding language is really the communication part of it. Not that, you know, you actually have to use that to really develop something really sophisticated because, you know, that's the expertise of a developer. But you need to be able to know, like, what all the different terms mean within that coding language. Um, and the sixth thing is our product user. So that means that you really need to understand what your company's goals are, like what the product's goals are, as well as the people who are using it. Because if you design something at the end of the day that looks really nice, like a beautiful piece of artwork, but you don't know who you are, who is the user, and you don't know why they're having this problem, your solution is not going to be something that is useful anyway. So these six elements together uh, is what I think uh, web design really is about. Um, the difference between this and app design um, is that app design has a much smaller screen space. Um, so there are more constraints. It's a good and bad thing. You have a smaller screen, but you need to know lesser things as well because it's a smaller, it's a smaller, there's a smaller space that you need to design in. Um, but for web design, it's a really huge piece of canvas. So you do need a better grasp of color principles, uh, layout design especially. So um, the skill set that's required is mostly the same, um, but web design is a more... Um, more complicated art, in my opinion. Yeah, so um, that's the difference. 
So um, let's move on to the elements of web design. So um, this is really the UI elements part. So there are essentially four different things that are really important. The first thing is layout. So you need um, in, your, in your web design or like a website or like a product software that you want to create, um, it needs to have a really good layout. So what this means is a clear and logical visual hierarchy with consistency. This is the best way I could summarize it. Um, it needs to be clear to the user how to use it. It needs to be logical, which means that how the user would think this is the pattern that you want to, these are the different elements. Like if you, if you put the contact us right at the top, there's something a bit uh, wrong. If that's not the user, that's not the user's goal of going to your website. Um, it needs to be consistent, which means that if you use a certain style, it needs to be uniform, which brings on to my second point about color. So um, creating a uniform color scheme throughout the design. So you, in, a, in web design, it's quite tricky because you often have about 10 pages, even in, in a very simple website, you have like 10 different pages and all of them need to have a certain color scheme so that it looks unified as a website or unified as a product. And this can get quite complicated, which I will share a bit more later. So the third thing that is very important is choosing graphics. So um, this is something that most people tend to overlook. Um, it's, um, it's, you know, we always try to get like free resources, free graphics, uh, free um, different ways we can get resources to, you know, um, make sure that our graphics are consistent. Um, and what consistent means, uh, usually there are two things. One is a style. So style refers to like, if your website has a lot of humans, like you choose to use humans as the way like you know pictures of humans are uh, in different parts of your website so make sure that that's consistent like you don't want to have one page that's full of humans and another page that is like hand-drawn illustrations then that will be quite like people will wonder like am i on the same website it just looks like something that is poorly designed by different designers um and even to the use of icons you know icons are such a powerful thing to quickly tell a user like what is that tool for or what is it for um if you choose to use line icons, which means they are outlined, just one line, then use all line icons. But if you want to use like field icons that are colored, an uh, example would be like this kind of icons, then make sure that all of it are also the same and consistent throughout the website. And the fourth thing that, you know, is one of my, I guess I'm very passionate about uh, is typography. Uh, so typography is basically how different fonts, uh, text come together to become a graphic, basically. So um, what that means is that um, because most people don't realize this, but text is actually one of a very, it's a very powerful graphic, graphic element. So most people think of text as just like words, but actually text in itself is a graphic. The way you put it together, becomes, it becomes a very powerful graphic. And you know, with the trend of things being very minimalistic, um, the minimalist kind of style, uh, it's even more important that um, the good grasp of how to use uh, good, text and layout is a very, very key skill um, that is very hard to master and achieve um, unless through like a lot of experience and reading and looking and training your design eye. Um, then you can put all these four elements to really create something that's very, very polished. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, the hatch team, if there's anything like, you know, just feel free to let me know because I don't think I can see the notifications. <laughs> yeah, just saying. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to also go through a bit of, you know, how we usually do it, like uh, how my team at Bantu as well as myself, how we usually go through like um, developing a single feature. Um, I've tried to break it down. Uh, I mean, I've tried to summarize it in like three, four key steps. Um, but actually, you know, in the real process, it takes much longer. Um, but the first thing is that what we do is always to define needs. So what this means is that um, what, when, we have exist, when we have a problem, like let's say a, 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 a user writes to us and says, hey, I can't do this thing, why? Or like, hey, this thing is not working, like why? So what we do is that we first understand the existing user behavior and needs. Like, you know, what's the real reason? Is it because um, the button isn't big enough? Is it because we hide it somewhere too deep within the product? Um, is it because the function is just not available? Or is it just because the person doesn't know how to use and if the person doesn't know how to use it, means that, you know, maybe we could put some visual cues that could guide the user to, to do that thing instead of facing a problem. And a very important thing is to do market research. So we have, we would understand that, you know, how our existing, uh, it doesn't, it's not competitors per se, but people who have the same UI problem, like how do they solve it? Like, you know, if we have a calendar problem, then how do other companies with calendar um, interfaces, like how do they solve the, that problem for the user? So we go and understand like, how do other people do it? 
um, after discussing within the team. What we would do is that after finding all the different uh, things that people are doing, existing solutions, understanding the problem that our customer face, um, we would put that together and develop a solution that is tailored for the problem that the user is facing. So um, interesting, uh, an interesting story that uh, I wanted to share was that I went for an interview when I was quite, a few years ago when I wanted to be a designer and then um, the interview asked me, um, so uh, how, how would you develop an app that is, a, that is a competitor of Facebook, like a social media app, something like that. And then um, I said that, oh, you know, I would study all, the, uh, all of Facebook's different features and then I will find the best ones and then I'll put it under the new design. And that was my answer back then when I was like, not experienced at all. I just went for an interview because I wanted to understand the job market in Singapore and what UX and UI is in Singapore. And actually the interviewer, she said something that I always remember is that, um, you need to design something based on your business goals and that matches your user needs. So it's not about copying an existing solution, which is what a lot of people do actually nowadays. Like, um, I, have, I, have, I have interns who used to tell me that uh, their, um, their ex-company that they used to work for would tell them like, just make the app nicer. Uh, just make the design nicer. I, I don't know how, but um, go look at other people's one and make it the same as them. And that's really not what you want to do um, because it does your target audience, your user, your user profiles are different from them. And it's good to reference other people's work and what they already did, but you need to be able to consolidate that and synthesize into something that actually matches like what your needs are, uh, what your user needs are. So that's a very key skill. Uh, secondly, is to create uh, wireframes. Uh, and prototypes. So this is actually the second step in the process. So what usually happens after we know like, okay, this is the problem, this is what we need to do. We need to be able to visualize it for each other to understand like how would that eventually look like. So that comes in the form of wireframes and prototypes. So whether is it sketching on paper or a simple design tool, you should create wireframes to show um, each other, kind of like that picture illustration that I showed there. So it's like just creating simple things to show that, okay, these are going to be the buttons. Okay, the image is going to be in the middle and then we have text on the right and text on the left. So it's a very simple way of explaining to people like how do you imagine your design to be like. And the focus here should be about usability and logic, not about design aesthetics. So at this point of the process, right, I don't, I don't really care like how polished the design is, whether is it like the colors I use currently. It can be a totally black and white design. It's totally fine. Um, what is important here is that we are solving the problem that the user faces. So that is usability and logic. Um, and then after you create like so after you have the, the wireframe and prototypes you will go to a process where you know you create a very nice version of it with colors properly like every pixel is correct like everything is designed really nicely like a real it's like real it looks like real so once you have that you will need to validate that with your users so either with your users that you have access to that you can talk to or talk to your internal team, you know, that you have that, maybe starting with the design team and then you can branch it out to the tech team and then branch it out to the CEO and, you know, understand from the salesperson even, like, how is it? Uh, what do they think of it? So that's the validation process that we do to ensure that, you know, yeah, we are solving the problem that, um, that we, we are solving the problem that really exists. So a nice polished version. Um, so then let's move on to a bit about interface tools. Um, so, you know, in the market today, there are three basic, um, most like common and uh, popular tools, uh, which is Sketch, Figma, and Adobe XD. Um, I think people always ask me, like, you know, which tool do you use? Uh, you know, which tool is the best? Like, which one, which one is better? Which one, is, uh, which one do you think will work the best? Uh, I, what I always say, and I always say the same thing, is that to me, at the end of the day, it's just a tool. To me, it depends on the needs of your team. Like if you're a really small team, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Even if you use PowerPoint, it doesn't matter. Um, at the very beginning, it's okay. But as your team grows, maybe you need more functions and features like collaboration tools, collaboration features. Then maybe you can use something like Figma, which I think is quite good at it. Um, so, but if you are just starting out, you know, and just um, you're starting out and you want to embark on this career as a, as a, like a web designer, um, you can start off with any tool. Because at the end of the day, when you are familiar with one, um, most the platforms are the same in terms of the functions of how to create a rectangle, create a square, create a circle. Um, it's the same. Uh, choosing colors, changing the fonts, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, it's just that um, the, 
additional features to work together could be different. Yeah, so it's easy to swap around once you are familiar with one. Um, so I'm not too concerned with which tool you use as long as you are happy with using that tool. Just get started. That's my point. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so at Bantu, um, this is actually what we really do. Uh, the first thing is that we use, um, we do the low fidelity prototyping, which means like, you know, the, um, the very like raw version of it, like you can see, these are examples, okay, these are not real designs. Um, this is like, you know, it looks really just, just about squares and, and, and rectangles and a few colors, just two colors showing different things. I will actually do that on PowerPoint, but I'm not even kidding. Like we use PowerPoint to, or rather Google Slides like, to be exact so that we can share with each other. Hey, this is how I imagine it to look like. This is how I think it should look like at the end of the day. And that's what we use. And then after that, we would translate that onto Sketch to do the high fidelity so that it looks really polished, like as if it is real. And then we would give this design to the developers to help us to implement it into real life. So um, these are the real tools that we use. Um, so I think this, this class is about web design, right? So I just wanted to go through, you know, like what exactly are you expected to know or design when you are a UI web designer? Um, it's actually quite nerdy, in my opinion. Like, when I was creating this slide, I was like, wow, I'm a true nerd. Like, I care about these things. Yeah, so it was quite hilarious. But um, the things that, you know, I design a lot are, like, fields. Like, you know, even a username, password field. Um, buttons. Uh, buttons are super common. It's, like, the most common basic thing that you need to be able to master. Uh, selectors. So, whether it's drop downs, uh, checkboxes, um, uh, selecting like this, uh, like a... Like a uh, this small, medium, large example here. These are all different types of selectors that you need to help a user to be able to choose their options, put in their field, put in their information, whatever it is. The fourth thing is navigation. So if you look at this picture, um, it's actually like, you know, this part um, to help a user like find the things that they want to, 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 to navigate to immediately. Five uh, would be icons. So icons are like, you know, these things. And you notice that all of them have specific colors, which are actually quite nice. Um, and you know how the icons uh, translate together with the words here and the information that is presented beside it. So that's icons. Uh, being able to create good, uh, pair good icons with colors at the back. Uh, whether is it line, field icons? Um, these are all things that you have to think about. As well as I think the last thing I wanted to include was cards. So these are very common nowadays. You know, if you go to any marketplace, you want to buy an item, you want to, you, you want to volunteer somewhere, um, they are all like, different cards that, you know, has data inside and to be able to design a nice card that contains all the information so that the user will click on it, um, it's a very key skill. Uh, so these are some of the UI elements that are very, very common uh, within a single web page. And um, this will be quite different from uh, apps uh, because um, you, don't, you won't have things like uh, big cards inside uh, that fills up a very huge space. Um, so it's quite different from uh, app design. So uh, they are quite different, but they reuse some of the elements. Um, but the way you would do it, because you have much larger space, would be quite different as well, because you have a lot of space to deal with. A lot of space is actually quite scary. Uh. Like you need to fill up the space uh, while still maintaining that balance of being minimalist and clean and clear, but still being able to deliver the job. So, um, you know, I, I was asked to choose a topic, you know, that I wanted to share about. Okay, let me just check on the time. Okay, yeah, so I, want, I, I was tasked to share about the topic, you know, that would really help people who are listening in to this webinar. Um, and I decided to choose color and palettes. And the reason for that is because it is the foundation of any web design, whether it's creating buttons, creating any of the things that I mentioned here, everything involves uh, colors and palettes. Um, so um, you will be able to see the applications of it uh, within the next few slides that I will share. Um, so the first thing I wanted to share is, uh, maybe you guys have seen it before, um, but this is essentially the color wheel. Um, so the color wheel is really the basics of learning color. And you know, you have the wheel, like basically it's a wheel and then you have like yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, orange, red, whatever the different colors are. And um, it's actually a very powerful tool. So um, the, if you don't remember anything about the color wheel that I will share today, just remember this code, which is, all colors are the friends of their neighbors and the lovers of their opposites. You will understand later if you get this set of slides and you will understand why I'm writing this. So you can check it out later. So the first thing is that um, I want to share a bit about how people create colors. You know, um, this is a very common concept, a basic concept that once you know this, even you memorize it by heart, right? It really empowers you as a designer. Um, the first thing is complementary colors. 
So um, this refers to like colors that sit opposite each other on the color wheel. So you know, it can be any kind of mix like here to here, here to here, this blue to this orange, um, this blue to this orange, uh, this green to this purple. Um, it can be uh, any, of, any of these combinations. So what this usually does is that uh, it creates a very vivid and energizing effect. Uh, because it's, it, it's actually most commonly uh, under, misunderstood as contrasting colors. Um, in fact, there's no such thing in the color wheel concept. Uh, it's actually complementary colors. They are so different from each other that it works well. It's like they are so opposite each other that you know they work the best together. It's pretty uh, funny. So I put a, two examples here, which are the IKEA logo and the Krispy Kreme donut logo. You can go match it yourself after this, but they're actually sitting opposite each other. But most of the time, these are things that we don't really think about. So uh, the next one is uh, adjacent colors. So they're actually colors that sit beside each other. So uh, what this does is uh, it creates a calming, likable impression. So similar to PayPal, this is actually what they do. Like They put two colors that are sitting right beside each other, and it works really well. So um, what I'm trying to teach uh, everyone here is you know, how to quickly create color combinations that work well together without looking like a mess. Um, these are actually like a real technique to do so. The third thing is uh, triad colors. So these are colors that are sitting equidistant from each other on a color wheel. So you can actually take this triangle and turn it in any way, and any of the three colors will work well. Um, so this, what this does is that it produces a high contrast effect, similar to the, similar to the complementary colors, um, while still preserving harmony. So a very good example is the Burger King logo. Um, they actually use this technique to create logos. So if you ask, like, you know how do people create logos and nice color schemes? This is actually how they do it. Like, they pick colors on the color wheel. Maybe you can just do some randomizing thing and then you'll figure out, like, okay, these are the three to use. Yeah, so um, this is actually how designers create, like, color patterns and things to use, especially in logos, because logos are about brand identity. So it's even more important that the correct colors are used. Um, the last one I wanted to share is called monochromatic colors. So um, they refer to different saturations of the same hue. Okay, so this sounds really complicated, but actually it's pretty simple. Like if you look at the example I give on the left, um, if you go from a very light orange to a very dark orange, this refers to the saturation. The more saturated it is, the more like darker, the like, more color there is. So if you move, you look at the colors within this one that I'm pointing at, they're actually really, really like dull. There's a lot of white. It's, it's very, very white. So it's like the saturation is really low. So this part is hue. So it just refers to the color. So this is one hue. This is another 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 hue. So it's just um, the whole color wheel, essentially. So um, if you talk about monochromatic colors, it means that your palette is just light all the way to like dark. Yeah. So there's another quote that I like here. Um, it says, uh, if one says red, the name of a color, and there are 50 people listening, like today, there are, I don't know how many people, people there are listening, but it can be expected that there will be 50 rates in their minds and one can be sure that all these rates will be very different. Yeah, so that's essentially my point. Um, in one color like red, you can have so many different hues, uh, the different types of colors within even one. Um, and you know, colors are just a very amazing uh, tool that you can use in your design. So uh, I think this is the... A very interesting part that I wanted to go through. So let's see an example. You know how do color palettes actually work in a web in in a sample web design? So you know you know as a designer, you know, okay, you you spend a long time deciding like red is a very powerful color because you want to invoke like fire. You want to use yellow because it's a milder color. So you spend a lot of time deciding the palette. So uh, I chose these five palettes, uh, five colors. So the hex codes, hex codes refer to the color, the color name. So the blue, the blue, the green, the yellow, and the red. So I'm like wow. I've done a great job. Time to create my design. So what will happen, right, is that this is actually what will happen. What you will end up with is this mess. And um, it looks like you could never use this because it's so poorly colored. So to have a list of five hex codes or colors, it's not going to create a good palette automatically. So it's not enough with just five colors. What actually happens in real life or real products, right, is that you need something that's much more comprehensive a set of colors. So you can see the bottom that uh, I labeled here is like, you have all these different um, colors that actually goes into this design of this uh, web app. Um, so you have green, you have this, this dark blue, this blue, this lighter blue, this green, and all of it functions differently, which is very different from the initial color palette that I chose. And the reason for that is because one, when you choose a color, you need to be able to use the different types, the different colors that 
the, the, the color that you choose here is the center color, the primary color, but you need to be able to develop more colors from this palette. So let me share a bit um, what I'm talking about. So actually, um, yeah, this is uh, something that I, I, I enjoy uh, thinking a lot about. Um, is that actually a website has many, many, many colors. Um, there are three types, essentially. So one is the grays. You have primary colors and accent colors. So grays, right, actually refer to the text, the backgrounds, the panels, the form controls. There's a lot of grays. Um, uh, a lot of parts of the web design that uses gray. Uh, because gray is like a kind of like a white, so it's like a very neutral color that you need as the base of your design. Uh, you wouldn't want to have like, you know, blue and like yellow as the base because it's very, very like bad for the eyes and people won't find it enjoying using this. So you have primary colors. So primary colors are usually like the primary actions, uh, navigation elements, overall look of the site. Uh, I'll go through in detail later. So uh, accent colors are diff basically other colors. Oh, sorry, Siri. Anyways, um, so accent colors are basically the other colors that you use to communicate other things to the user. So let me show you some examples. So let's talk about grays first. So you know, in this web design that I show you, there's like buttons, there's like form fields, there's uh, information about payment method. So in this, even this simple uh, graphic here, right, you can see that there are already like five types of grays, like from the darkest gray all the way to the lightest gray. Um, in fact, uh, most of the things, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, almost everything in interface is gray. Um, and a well-developed site usually has eight to 10 shades of grays to choose from, um, which are things that we don't really notice when we look at a website, a well-developed website. So primary colors. So primary colors are used like, for example, I choose like this blue as, okay, maybe I choose this orange I'm wearing as, as uh, my company's primary color. But within, after I choose this primary color, I need to have other um, primary colors that I can use developed from the first primary color. So they, because they are used for primary actions, navigational elements, um, such as this is the prime call to action button, the most important button that I want people to go to. But I also need to show them some important information like the step billing information, you know, where the user is at at this point. But you don't want to keep reusing the same like blue because it will make it too blue. But you need to have different shades of that particular blue so that you can use it in different places. Um, so um, I have a question here for everyone. Um, so if I ask you right now to recall from your memory, right, how does Facebook's website look like? What is the color you will tell me? Like how, what is the overall color that Facebook uses? Uh, at this point, we will start a poll. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so um, please select uh, which color you think. Is it mostly blue, mostly gray, or mostly white? Uh, I'll like give 10 seconds to everyone to put in your answer, okay? Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, um, everyone please submit your answer. Okay, can I, can I see the results please? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, if you can see the results on your screen, you'll see that 50% of people said uh, it's mostly white you will see that 33% uh, of people said mostly blue and the least number of people, 17% of people said mostly grey. So uh, I can see that majority of you said uh, mostly white uh, and then mostly blue. So let me show you what is the real Facebook website look like. Um, if you can look at my screen now, um, actually Facebook's website is mostly grey. Uh, but most people don't actually realise this. Uh, and um, most people think it's white because, you know, there's probably a lot of fields, like, you know, all these, like, different, um, different, uh, different text boxes. Uh, it is, it's a lot of gray, then a lot of white, then a lot of blue. So, uh, in fact, um, reason why I ask this question is because, um, when Facebook chooses their, you know, their primary color, they will have chosen, they will have chosen blue. And that really leaves that impression on people's mind that, okay, Facebook is blue, blue is Facebook. And that determines the overall look of the site. But in actual web design, like uh, most of the most of it is actually just grays and whites. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting thing for everyone to think about. Um, and then the last thing we have is accent colors. So accent colors are actually a it's a very interesting tool to use because they are used to communicate communicate things that need attention, but they are not really like super important. Like they just need quick attention from the user at this point in time. Like 
to tell you something, um, but they don't need to be there. Like it's not a call to action button. I don't need you to click on this all the time. So um, if you look at the example that I'm showing here, you can see that the new, the, 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 the word here new, is actually trying to tell the user that there's a new feature. So in this case, they use like a teal to be able to show the word new with another darker teal to, for the words inside the lighter teal. So some examples of this that's used in websites, um, it's basically deactivating. So this is a pop-up that shows deactivation of accounts. So red is used to, red is used for telling a user destruct, destructive actions because you don't want them to like delete their data by accident. You don't want them to share their data by accident. You don't want them to delete their account by accident. And then you have yellow. So yellow is usually used for warning messages. So it's not like destructive, but it's like, hey, you must be an administrator to access this page. Or, hey, you need more login credentials. So these are usually used for warning messages. So even within one pop-up like this, right, you can see that, you know, there are so many different yellows used. And then you have green. So green is, uh, I think everyone is more familiar with. So it's like used, you know, for positive things. It means that like you did a right action. It's like a positive affirmation kind of color that's being used to tell you that, hey, there's a, your stocks are increasing poop for you. Yeah, so it's like a positive trend or action that's taken. So in fact, right, in the website, a complicated UI website, right, um, actually this is a very basic color palette that is used. So you have the primaries, you have the neutrals, and you have the accents. So you have like blue, you have like gray, you have green, you have a green, yellow, and red. But actually, you know, there's a huge spectrum of, spectrum of each that needs to be created because you can't just use one blue for everything. You, just, you can't just use one yellow for everything because it just looks... It just looks like a like a very amateur, like you know, you start from the very beginning. So, you know, at the end, um, if you do learn web design, you know, this is the kind of skill that you'll be able to master. Um, to know like, okay, this is how a well developed uh website should look like a product. So um, you know, this is the last part of my sharing. Um so let's have some practice. So at this point we'll use some zoom, we'll use the zoom post. Uh I'll be asking a series of questions and you'll vote which one you think is the best. Um, there is no right and wrong answer. Um, in design, right, everything is kind of subjective, um, but there is a better answer, but not the right one, but it's just better. So take note of that. So the first one, uh, if everyone is ready. Okay, so which color scheme is better? Uh, thanks, Hatch Team. <laughs> okay, I'll give everyone a few seconds. Um, you can answer in the poll, guys. Yeah, uh, put put in the poll. Yeah. Uh, answer in the poll, so I can you know I can understand like, how everyone is thinking. You should see a poll pop up at this point. I think. <laughs> um. Okay. Let's uh. Let's see what everyone says. Okay, so most people think it's uh most people think it's B, right? Uh sixty nine percent of people uh say it's B. Uh and A thirty one percent of people chose it. Um does anyone wanna share like why you chose B or A? Uh you can share it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and just say one line. <laughs> uh, like you must sorry, support. Yeah, I think just now we have tendered the, some of the basic color patterns that you have uh, actually introduced. Mm -hmm. Actually, I found that actually to catch an eye, uh, a lot of dark colors, maybe you will not actually instantly catch the eye attention, especially PowerPoint slide. Uh. You imagine everything so dark, right? Like the words uh, doesn't appear much. Uh. It also affect the mood, uh, how people are reading. I think generally the, the three colors on the right, which is the B, are more, are more on the softer side. I think I, I feel comfortable, you know, when I look at it because I think that uh, they are some, somehow fall in the in the gray side, you know, the something something similar to what the Facebook has done. I think is on the softer side, where I think probably you can last longer looking at the website. I see. I okay, so you are in favor of B. Am B. I right? Yes. Okay. Um, I think someone in the chat also says that uh, you need. Dark, light, and mid-tone colors. Uh, can I assume that you are choosing B? I don't know which option you chose. Um, does anyone who chose A like want to share like why you chose A? Um, by the way, um, being able to communicate why you think something is better than the other is a key skill that a designer has. Yeah, needs to have. Yeah, so you can try. 
uh, like it's a very it's a very simple exercise. So like, does anyone want to share like why you think A is better for the thirty one percent of you? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, the next question, like, I hope to have more responses because like, then I can know, like, you know, why you guys are thinking this way. Um, so, uh, let's take a look. So, actually, B is the preferred color scheme. So, as I said, there's no right and wrong, uh, and I'll explain why. Um, B is the preferred color scheme. Why? Why? Because, right, um, this is actually an additional concept that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, when you choose highly saturated colors, like the color palette that I show in A, right, um, it looks hazy or blurry when you pair it together. So if you can look right in the middle here, it when you start to look at the middle, right, you can't really, it's less this, this it's harder to tell the colors apart in comparison to B. Like you can see very clearly like there, there are three distinct colors because they are different uh, saturations and different hues. And why this is important is because actually when you do web design, right, you need to pay a lot of attention to like, accessibility. So that means uh, colorblind people. Uh, what happens is that when you choose highly saturated colors, actually the blind, the blind people who have color blindness um, cannot really see the colors differently. So um, it just looks like this. Like this is what it really looks like to them. And as a result of that, they can't tell like what is the difference between each color. So um, one important thing I wanted to introduce at this point is also that uh, web design, you need to think about people who are colorblind. And actually colorblindness is very, very common. It's not as, not as uncommon as we think. Yeah, so um, um, it's important to think about uh, colorblindness as well when you are thinking about colors. Yeah, so... Um, but whether or not, you know, this set is better than the other, uh, it depends on the application, depends on the kind of, uh, it, it really depends. Like if in the A, you use a lot, a lot of whites, like you are very, you have a really, really white website and then you use all these as primary colors, accents and primary colors and accents essentially, then maybe it will work out fine. Like it really depends. Like there's no, it depends on how you lay it out, uh, even if you chose A. Yeah. So B is just that it's easier for people to tell the difference between each color. So it's more likely that this is a better color palette. I hope this answers your question, everyone. Okay, so let's move on to uh, number two. So for number two, we have these two different uh, two different um, options. So which design do you think is better? Uh, we'll use the poll again at this point. Okay, we, uh, I hope everyone has put in your decision. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's see the results. Oh, it's quite a neutral, interesting. Um, we have 54% of people saying that it's B and 46% of people saying that it's A. Um, well, it's quite a, quite a mixed response. Uh, can anyone share with me why? I'm very friendly, really. Like, so you just feel free to share. I think Flau has shared in the chat. Oh, let Why me take B. Um, B. Okay, so wait, wait, it's jumping a lot. <laughs> uh, um, someone says A because it's clearer and it captures my attention better. Um, B, uh, as the color, as the changing color background highlights what has been chosen. Uh, A is nicer for me than B. Uh, I chose A because it's cleaner to look at. I pick B for the US experience. It's clear for me to see what I selected versus the whole field to be selected, right? Just in the circle. Uh, a looks cleaner. Wow, thanks everyone. So I can see that uh, I prefer B because it provides more visual confirmation of what has been selected. A because black text is easier to read and focus. Um, B, the blue highlight has a sharp corner which contradicts the rounded corner of the card. Um, Yes, uh, and B is easier to the eyes, and B is better B. Okay, so I, I see that, um, yeah, it's quite a mixed response. Um, one more person, okay, so B for me, because being one of the colorblind makes it hard for me to read the bluish font uh, on the bluish background, so you choose A. I see, I see. Okay, thanks everyone for sharing. So let me share with you uh, that B is actually the preferred one. Um, 
again, uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but there's a justification for this. So, right, um, the reason for that is because um, when you do something like B, right, you actually have higher selection visibility because you change the text color to blue as well as the background. So, when the user selects that option, right, they know that, okay, I selected these two for sure. There's higher, like someone said, visual confirmation, which is exactly the point that I'm trying to bring across. Um, it helps the user to know which option was selected. So, um, again, there's no right and wrong. It just depends who you are targeting and what your objective is in your design. If your objective is to provide higher visual confirmation, then this is a design that you will adopt. And if you just want things to be, you don't want to use that blue as a as the way for the text, right? Then you can choose A. It's fine as well. It's just that B has additional advantage of having better visual confirmation. I hope that's clear. Um, let's go on to number three. Um, so number three, which design is better? Uh, at this point, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait a couple of seconds. Okay, three, in case you can't decide, three, two, one. Okay, oh, I can see that a, mass, a, a vast majority of you chose B. Um, okay, uh, does anyone want to explain uh, why you chose B? Let me see the chat. Um, B is better, but then A is easier to do than B. Okay, this is a developer for sure. Uh, B, uh, I can differentiate the two buttons better. Uh, the, the primary action button should not have the same style as the secondary action button. Uh, B highlights the preferred option and puts skipping like a less preferred option. Okay, uh, B shows a preferred choice. B, 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 B. Okay, yeah, different meaning. Okay. Clearer selected choice. Okay, yeah. So actually, you're right. So um, B is the clear uh, answer that you know. Actually, B is better. Um, the reason for that is because you want to use a different color when it comes to a call to action button versus something that's secondary. So you know, in this case, for let's say this this app, right? They are like a um, they want to ask you to import songs into your watch. So if you do as, as a user, if you import songs into your watch, this means that you uh, you have achieved their business goal because they want the business or the company wants you to import songs. So this clearly means that importing songs rather than skipping it is a more important action. So you want to be able to put the primary action color, but uh, primary color to the primary action button, which is import songs, and use a light, um, use a lesser saturated color as a secondary button so that it's clearer. So I think everyone got it. Good job. So um, I think this is my last question. I think it's my last question. Um, which is better? Oh, by the way, everyone, please ignore the arrow on question on, on, on B. Ignore that arrow. It's not supposed to be there. So as you are choosing, right, feel free to let me know in the chat, like, which is the option you choose and why. Okay, let's uh, see the results. Uh, I'll give some everyone a bit of time to share with me why, uh, because this is slightly lengthier, maybe. Okay, so I think overwhelmingly everyone chose A. Um, Maybe for some of you, you might not be able to explain clearly, you know, why you think A is better. Um, but that is also part of the skill of being a designer. So being able to communicate like why you think one is better than the other. And like why. It's a communication is a very like, it's a visual, it's a visual art. But you have to use words to communicate with others. So it's quite a tricky thing to be able to do. Uh, so we have, okay. Uh, since 100%, okay, no one's really debating, but it's, everyone thinks A, which is great. Um, better padding, better use of space, easier on the eyes, uh, more space in between. B looks like 1990 and A looks more modern. Okay, A, uh, because good spacing, easy for the eyes, uh, ratio, 
within the box but to the entire frame. Wow, okay, that's great. Uh, I chose A but now I can't see their difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's hilarious. Uh, B is too cramped and hard to read, even harder for people diagnosed with dyslexia. Oh, that's true. Um, A must be seen. So, if you can see everyone's uh, response in the chat, right, you will notice that everyone uses a different way of explaining why A is better than B. And that's the point that I wanted to bring out here. Um, when you are more um, well versed, like designer, right, you'll be able to explain things um, with lesser words and not just about the feel. It's like, I feel A is better. Or I feel B is better. Or like, you know, B is more, um, B looks less slick. You know, these are words that layman people would use because you that's what you want the eventual result to the user. That you, that's what you want them to feel. More modern, more sleek, uh, cleaner. These are all words that lay, laymen, they are not like the designer themselves would use because that's the effect you want. Um, but then, you know, if you're trying to communicate like why A is better, you usually say things like, it's better spaced out. Um, here we be click it's better spaced out um you know there's more padding we should add more padding in between each of the sets of elements um and someone said uh you know the 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 where's, where's that uh where's that um uh ratio not just between the box but to the entire frame so these are also things that you know you need to be able to um communicate um easily to other people um by using certain design um concepts uh like and more technical terms like padding or margin or the X height or you know, more uh, technical terms to be able to convey what you want to say to the fellow designer or to the rest of your team. Yeah. Um, sorry, what is... Uh, sorry, what is padding? Uh, padding just means spacing. La. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, it's important to use the different terms because you have things like margin and padding that is quite similar, but they are not. So um, it's also used in the uh, HTML, CSS. So they actually use words like padding inside the syntax of the language and margin. So these are actually terms that are also used with the developer as well as the designer. So that's why it's good to use these terms. If you say to them spacing, it's like, the developer probably gets it, but there's actually a more accurate term, which is uh, padding or margin. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, yeah. So what I wrote here was that um, A to me is better because um, you have better element spacing. And why you should do that is because you, if you don't have enough space between each input, which means like the different placeholders, it's harder for the user to fill it out. And the last thing why you want to do this is because good spacing helps with readability. And at the end of the day, you want the user to be able to read your, you don't want them to fill in their password in the username field, for example. So um, this is a very good example of um, being able to converse um, the design language from one person to the other. Yeah. Thanks. That's the end of my sharing. Uh, I hope that was uh, useful in many ways. Um, and also, if you want to reach me, that's my email. And that's our, um, our startup's uh, website. Yeah. So um, you can email me if you have any questions you want to ask. I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. Uh, Hatch, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing the knowledge with us, Janelle. Uh, we can take some questions now from the floor, if there are any. Um, there was a question by Albert, I think quite earlier on, if I could summarize, uh, he would like to ask you, Janelle, um, what are some available tools out there one can use to develop a website? Um, do you use popular software to develop like Macromedia Studio or customized website design basic tools like HTML language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, I, are you asking me this question? Uh, or no, did someone from ask? Albert. From Albert like, oh, Albert. Okay, yeah. sorry. I must have missed that question. Yes, yes. Uh, because I understand, right, these basic design tools, right, I'm not very sure after we actually attended this, right, how are we going to apply it? Are we going to buy our own software? Or are we going to use a service? Or are we going to uh, go get and some online, you know, online, there's a lot of uh, web design, a uh, free mm -hmm. a website a template for us to use. But mm -hmm. I'm also worried that there are security uh, issues, uh, because you know, right, we also know that some 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 hacker may go inside and do something to the server. I don't know. Okay. Um, to answer, uh, I I can answer your question. Um, so to put it simply, it what tool you use depends on your objective. So what I mean by that is that if you are just developing a website, so like let's say you want to create a personal portfolio of your own works, like you know things that you have done, uh, something like the kind of the animation or the video I showed earlier of like the, the portfolio that I have, that's actually my personal portfolio I made. Uh, and for that, I use Wix. So why I use um, something that is, you know, it's like pre-made, like, you know, I, I just pay them like a sum of money and then I have everything that, you know, is very easily 
uh, it can be easily uh, used. Uh, the reason for that is because that's the purpose of it. I just want it to be a gallery of things that I want to show everyone. And there's nothing more to it. And you know, I, it's easy to use because I can achieve my objective very quickly. Uh, it's just a personal gallery. So for that, right, I would choose like Wix because it has like templates that I can start with and I can use my own design skills to make it the way that I want it to be. So in mm -hmm. fact, I customize a lot of it even if I use like Wix, for example, I customize a lot of it to the design and the style that I want, changing the illustrations because I don't want to be concerned about the coding part. Like that's not my objective. Like I don't want to be burdened by that part because I'm not that good at it. So like I rather focus on the part that I'm good and for the purpose of the website, it's just a, it's just a gallery. So it's fine. But if you want to use, if you want to create a product like that, you actually want to sell and you know what, you want to be able to build a business out of that. Um, it's always best to uh, rely on your own in-house development because you have the most flexibility, you have the most control. Um, it's much more difficult as well because you need a developer that is really, really talented and a team that you work well with because now I can't do anything without a developer in that way. I can't do anything because I am now like, you know, I have to work in a team that I just focus on the design, someone else focuses on development. So then in that case, it's always better to have your own in-house developer. So to your question, after you, if you take a course or you know like a course um, to learn about this, what you should be able to take away is really the how all the design concepts, how to really apply it, um, and that if you one day become a designer in a in a company in a firm, um, that's when you'll be able to excel in that area. So it's it's a niche. Um, it's quite niche because you are focused on the design part of it. If you want to be focused to be a developer, then you know you can be a developer <laughs> yeah so it where you what you should use it for really depends on your objective or why you are creating that web design if that answers your question uh, yes yeah. uh, thank you for the uh, uh, questions but i'm sure that a lot of times right basically people uh, some people want to i'm sure that you know a lot of people use uh, blogger blog 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 are the template that is already easy available Mm -hmm. and I think you just chum, chum, you just put all the information inside and write story about yourself. Of course, mm -hmm. the, the 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 blog is a different uh, reach out to a different user like They are not talking about uh, maybe they're not even talking about the business point. They're talking about themselves, or even mm -hmm. they also probably people use blog to show showcase themselves. So mm -hmm. it's a different application, I'm sure. But I'm sure that there are their website that actually helping people to learn as well to apply as a basic learners lah. But like people like like uh, I know nowadays, right? A lot of people like like to take things from off the shelf, meaning they don't they don't start from scratch. Uh. There are I'm sure there are available tools out there. Straight away, you just uh, um it. yes, if you just use it to facilitate your primary business, then it's okay. Like there are many people who use um online logistic software to help them to send their parcels out, but their actual business is making mobile phones, uh, mobile phone cases, for example. So um, it's, it, it's okay to use other people's software if it's not the primary, it's not your primary business. But if you build a software like, uh, like what we do at Bantu, then to use someone else's thing as the base is not going to be a good idea in the so long run because you always... Uh, well. Sorry? I think not very safe because in terms of uh, confidentiality and also uh, in terms of yeah, privacy, yeah. people may take your information because of the information, I, I don't know whether it belongs to you or belongs to the company that hosting the, the website for you. Because let's say I use a free web, I, see a, I use a free website, right? I need to uh, follow what, what the term and condition before I need to use their website because they allow me to use. But means the content uh, that I post it in, right? They may use it for other, other reasons. I, I, I don't know, is it? Yes, yes. Um... Yeah, thanks for your question. I hope everyone learned a lot uh, from that. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, we have one more question okay. uh, from Putri, maybe the last one because of time. The question is, what are some skills that you had to learn on your own or on the job? What were some skills uh, in web design? That you had to learn on your own or on the job? Um, it's a really good question. Um, um, I started off with like Photoshop skills, that was all. Uh, and if I'm not even an expert in it actually, like um, I, I am very interested in art, but then I didn't have any like skill set before I started. So um, I was really good at PowerPoint. That was what I was really good at, and I used that actually to create a lot of my initial designs, even like t-shirt logos, uh, uh, t-shirt designs. I use PowerPoint. Yeah, you'd be quite surprised. Um, 
But when I started this, uh, when I started this, I guess, design career journey thing, um, I had to learn how to use Sketch on my own. Um, and there's really a lot of resources out there that you can, um, I, I subscribe to certain YouTube channels that just teach us about how to use Sketch or design tool, whichever design tool. There's a lot of YouTubers that talk very in-depth about how they actually do it. Like, um, that's like one of the things that I used to do um, because you need to learn the tool, right? So you need uh, like a, you need to watch it. Otherwise, then you can pause it and then you can like, oh, I don't know how, what, what, where are you pointing? Then I will like go back and look. So uh, that's the, you know, as I was talking about the different uh, skills, I think six different things you need to know as a web designer. Um, one part of it was the design tool because that's like expected of every designer. Um, it's like, it's an expectation, yeah, which you should know as well. Um, and other things was definitely a huge part was communication. Um, people overlook this a lot, but as I was saying just now, you really need, um, a very uh, large number of vocabulary in terms of design, design, <laughs> um, design vocabulary to be able to explain concepts in a very clear manner for everyone on the team who has different agendas and different objectives. Like sales has different objective, uh, development has different objectives. So everyone has a different objective. So you need to learn how to communicate these um, your goals uh, very clearly to other people. Um, other skills I had to learn. Um, some basic, mm, no, um, not really lah. I mean, um, I have to learn UX lah, definitely as a skill. Like learning how to write user stories. That's a different. I guess that's a different course altogether. But because I'm one of the, I am the only designer back then. So like, I have to know everything. Um, from the biggest thing to the smallest thing. So I need to know uh how to write uh user stories, uh understanding personas, um knowing how to test knowing how to do research. So it's, um, I have an online checklist that I use uh, when I used to, be, when, I, um, when, I, uh, when I first started and I still use it till today actually. Um, so, um, but, but what I really recommend is to be passionate about it. That is the key, that is the key thing that, the key skill I have, uh, it's not really a skill, but um, some things that I do till today is that I view a lot of, if you look at my Instagram explore feed, I'm sure you guys can, uh, you should check out what's on your Instagram explore feed because it shows you what you're most interested in. For me, it's a lot of UI design, like uh, different people creating designs, uh, nice ones, they do animations, they do like app design, web design, like my explore feed is just full of that. <laughs> because you need to train your design eye. Uh, that's my point. Uh. You need to train your design eye. And this is something that you can't really teach. You need to, view and immerse yourself as if like design is a lifestyle and you will pick up this design eye after a while which means that i don't even need to say things like oh it has better margin or it's better padding or i i know very intuitively that this is better than the other and then i'll think about why but i knew i already know that one is better than the other so having that intuitiveness can only be trained um through viewing a lot of apps viewing a lot of websites and learning how to critique them to see what's wrong and what's right, then you will be able to have that intuitiveness um, that is commonly known in the design world as the design eye, lah, essentially. Yeah. Okay, there's one more question uh, in the mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. um, are there online resources you can recommend to help us select our color palette? Oh, um, that's a very easy question to answer. So um, you can just uh, you can ju just do a quick Google search. Uh, if let's say you have a color in mind already let's say you know that okay i'm gonna use purple because purple is my favorite color it's not by the way i'm just saying i mean like if i choose purple and then um i can go to a color palette color palette generator there are many many tools available like this and then i just put in the color that i want and they will generate a lot of different uh color sets that looks nice together so um, with generating color palettes, it's actually it's really, really easy. Like um, there's so many tools online, it's quite scary nowadays. Um, the difficult part is translating that into your design, which is the part that I was talking about just now. Um, it's very easy to generate a color palette, but it's difficult to make use of it. And then that is the skill, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Janelle, for sharing your journey with us. Um, if you have further questions for Janelle, you can contact her via her LinkedIn or her Gmail over here. Okay, so um, if you found this workshop interesting and would like to further your knowledge about these fields, uh, we have some programs you might be interested in. So I will invite Wanting from Hatch uh, to share more on this. Wanting? 
Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for staying throughout this workshop. Um, for those of you who found this workshop interesting and you want to find out more about the digital and design industries to further your skills, we essentially have two key programs. Um, first, we have the Hatch Immersive. Um, Hatch Immersive is an end-to-end -end training and job matching program that is aimed to kickstart your career. It is designed for anyone with like no background knowledge and just come in and just want to like learn. And it's really designed for people who want to embark on a new career or are looking to change your career. Essentially, at the end of the immersive program, you have an in-depth exposure to the core skill that is required in the industry. So currently for this program, um, we have two tracks, which is either in digital marketing or UI UX. Um, and we have the full-time program for immersive is two months and part-time is about three and a half months. Um, once you finish the program, we'll match you to one of our company, partner company within our network after you've met the after you've completed the training and met the uh, met the training milestones like, essentially. So we have an upcoming one for full-time digital marketing happening in August and then another one for part-time UI UX happening in September. Um, the next one, we have Hatch Accelerator. Um, it is essentially a five-week program that is meant to upskill you in specific skill sets and build specific, um, solid foundations like um, your different skills. So you develop like skills in like this different, um, in either digital or uh, skills that are inside the digital or design industry and you work through a problem statement for it. Um, this is suitable for those of you who just have a thing for design or some of you who want to start something new and instead of spending thousands of dollars on a web designer that you want to do yourself. So we have one program that's upcoming for web design that's happening on 30th June to um, 3rd August. And if you want to find out more about all these programs, feel free to hang around after this call. Uh, the Hatch team will be around to answer any questions that you may have. And yeah, that's all. Okay, uh, thank you, Wan Ting. Last but not least, I would like to share with you the other workshops we are, ho we are hosting as part of the Digital Pathways for All series. Um, they are happening on the 22nd and 29th May, so do sign up if you're interested. Um, these sessions have been carefully curated to share insights from industry experts, so don't miss out. Uh, and before we end the session, we appreciate that you could help us do a quick survey. Uh, we would like to hear your feedback about the webinar so we can improve the following sessions and also bring content that you're interested in. Um, from everyone at Hatch, we thank you for joining us today and we hope you have learned something that will set you on your growth career. So see you at the next session and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Janelle. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Thanks, okay. Janelle. <laughs> Thanks for joining, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the session. Add me on LinkedIn. <laughs> we hope you like the webinar. These are free and open sessions that we open to the public twice monthly and receive news on them by subscribing to our mailing list at our website at www.hatch.sg. For those of you who are interested in our programs, you can take a look at them on our website as well. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and feel free to leave your comments below or drop us a message if you want to find out more. Hope to see you at our future workshops. Bye.